Hello. Hello. Spooky people, it's our favorite time of the year. I feel like we need to do it like, it's our favorite time of the year. It's our favorite time, is it? It's our favorite time. Oh, I don't know. Where- <laughs> Two girls, one ghost. Two girls, one ghost. I think I just got abs from that laugh. (laughs) I think I did too, just from not breathing at all as you did it, because it was very spooky. Growing things, growing abs. Did did you, did he, is he here? I got super impatient, and so I tried to pick him out of his stump. Brian was like, what is that? Okay, it is, (gasps) I think it needs more time. I was really trying to pick him. His muscles, or is it his hair? He be lumpy. Oh, okay. He still has some growing to do. He definitely has. I need. I think I need to give him fresh water. But here he is, out of the water. Oh my! Look at those big feet. Got all these lumps, all these lumps and these humps, and look at that booty. Look at that booty. Yeah, yeah. Look at that booty. Oh, that's why you like Bigfoot. He's got a big butt. I love butts. Forget Bigfoot. Big booty. That's his name. We probably won't have another update of this Bigfoot because uh, I'm not recording again, but I'll take pictures. I'll put them on Patreon. Yeah. Once he is grown to his full his full form. But thank you. It's a fun gift. It said f- up to 48 hours and it's been 24 hours and I got impatient and started picking him. So we have time. We have time. Grow a Bigfoot. Hm. Oh, oh my gosh. Wait, what? I meant to tell you this months ago. I was just, but okay. this just now popped into my head as we were talking about this. I was walking through the North End in like July. And I hear the beautiful sounds of the Harry Potter theme music. And I was like, where is that coming from? And I walk into the park where Brian and I got engaged. It's literally steps away. There's someone sitting there playing a glass harmonica. Have you ever heard of that? No, but it's I if it sound if it looks like what it sounds like, it sounds beautiful. It's huge. It's like not even just a little harmonica that is glass. It is like this giant ass glass harmonica. And I, I'm gonna butcher this history right now because this just popped into my head, but I looked it up after because I was like, I have to tell Sabrina about this. This feels like for me so serendipitous that like one of her favorite movies is playing in a special spot to me and that has a lot of history involved with this musical instrument and she loves Harry Potter. I have to tell her. A glass harmonica was invented by Ben Franklin. I, we have to pull up a picture. I have to grab a picture right now. I wanna see, yeah. So I remember that it was invented by Ben Franklin and basically he had been spending a ton of of time going and watching different musicians sing and perform and wait sorry i'm trying to look this up at the same time and i can't multitask okay you tell us i'll look i'll look it up okay you look it up there was this period of time where he was going and he was really interested in all of these like amateur musicians who would perform sets and they would sing on musical yes there it is it looks like a massive like weed piece <laughs> yeah yeah or kind of like i almost picture it like a in cartoons where they have this giant contraption, like a giant laser beam that they use to like zap someone. Oh, and it has like a wheel. Oh my goodness. It's so cool. But yeah, he was watching people make music out of using basically glasses. I picture it. I don't know if this is what was happening, but I picture it, you know, like the cups where there's water and everyone's like, zzz, zzz, around, like yeah. a miscongeniality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was like, oh, I want to make a musical instrument of my own. And that is how he made the glass harmonica. It's from like the mid 1700s and they would put them on dinner tables and they would play. It's beautiful. Yeah. There was this woman just sitting out in the Paul Revere Park in the North End playing the Harry Potter theme song and telling everyone about the history of Ben Franklin's glass harmonica. How freaking cool. I know. So cool. I love that. I would, okay, if you could play one instrument, what would it be? (sighs) Man, the drums. Well, it's hard. It's hard because I feel like I'm like, oh, for for the ease of use and entertainment purposes, probably a guitar. But then my answer is when if I had the opportunity to be in a band and was actually great at a at a instrument, I would want to be drums. I would want to play drums if I were performing in a band. Hmm. I could see you like doing some like neck like, head banging, head banging. Yeah, like, oh yeah, your hair so into it, hitting the drums. Yeah. But then actually to the harmonica piece so i feel like a guitar is is not really for me it would be like me choosing a tar- a guitar because i know other people would like the sound of the guitar and it's like a thing that people like to gather on the campfire sing whatever i would love a harmonica and it actually came up the other day because 
I said to Brian, we were like walking through some street and someone was playing a harmonica, not the glass harmonica, a different one. And I was like, oh, I would love a harmonica. Like add that to your list when you're thinking of like gifts for me. And he goes, I already have it on the list. I said, you do? He goes, yeah, like a year ago, you also told me you really wanted a harmonica. <laughs> it's so funny because, well, one, props to Brian for stopping Writing it and down. taking note of things that you say you want. And two, even better for him that you forget because that means when he gets you gifts, you're like, oh my God, how did you know? How did you know? I only started wanting a harmonica a week ago. He's like, no, you've wanted it for years. For years. What would you play or want or do? Okay, so I have two answers. The practical every day would love to know for my own like entertainment and creative purposes, piano. Mm. For my spooky, creepy soul, an organ. Oh. Oh, beautiful. But I feel like if I learned the piano, it would be a gateway into organ playing. For sure. The organ is so difficult. I don't know how anyone can ever master it. But it's beautiful. It's it so is haunting. beautiful. But the, and there's so much. And it's also like, I feel like that's a very dramatic thing to play because you have to move between the different keys, like the boards. There's multiple levels. Yeah, there's multiple levels. Very dramatic. I have one last thing to say, and then I really want to hear the ghost stories you have prepared for us today. Okay. So I've been posting a lot about, and this we're recording this in middle of August before we go on tour end of August, whatever it is. I've been posting about Soot, Regina, the kitten that I've been fostering a lot. Soot slash Regina slash... Slash Grim slash Kitty slash... (laughs) Kitten. I love her. Um, Kitten, yes. So two things. One, yesterday I was reached out to by Strike Hat Alliance and they were like, we have a potential adopter. I'm pretty sure she listens to the podcast. Her name is Alejandra. Her and her husband are, and maybe by this point, they are in possession and own little kitty who TBD of her, what her name ends up being. I'm very excited and happy and also sad that she's finding a home. But she also, as she's gotten a little bit older, I realized she's a smoke black cat, which is super rare and not like super rare, but it's a unique fur pattern. So like the roots of her fur are like a white gray. Ah. <gasps> Oh, that's so cool. Are you sure you don't want to keep her? (laughs) I know. As she grows, you can kind of see. She's got like... She's got like a silver undertone. Yeah, which is why Litha had first said soot because she's got like the ashy fur. And Alejandra, if you adopt this little kitty, she likes to shower with you. She's a water cat. She's a water cat. Well, I think she also... She was just like wants to be around me all the time. So I was in the shower and she was like jumping in and she likes when I like hold her in the shower, but I don't like put her in the water. I'll just like hold her near me. And then today she just jumped in and fully got soaking wet. And I was like, okay. So then I just held her the whole time I showered and then wrapped her in a towel, dried her off. I know you sent me a picture. It was so cute. (laughs) She's so cute. Look at her like in a little ball right now. Oh my gosh. Are you going to foster again when we get back from tour? Definitely. Definitely. Stray Cat Alliance, baby. This this should be just like every month you foster a new one and it should just be. I my, So the almost your home, your cottage is like a rotating door for new foster kittens because I hope that they don't even spend yeah. that much time because people are like, I want to love this kitten I want forever. That one. Yes. And then our whole spooky community is just going to continue adopting cats that i foster and i promise i am a great foster i train these kitties so well they're gonna be great lap cats i want to request from stray cat alliance that they only give you black cats <sighs> but there's so many kitties i don't want to be selective other people can take care of those ones <laughs> black cats i actually really want to take the ones that are a bit like feral and need more tlc because there is nothing better than taking a little kitty who's terrified of humans and getting them to purr. Yes. Although, is this something that Leia would be able to handle or is this a... We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Poor Leia. She's like, oh my God. We'll see. Uh, she's big. She can hold her own. It's so funny. She is big, but she she's scared of little kitties. She's such a scaredy cat. Oh, <laughs> my dog was scared of cats and he was a big... He was part Doberman. He was a big guy. But cats are scary. They're unpredictable. It's the unpredictability of them. He was also afraid of pugs. So, you know, it's... Creatures, they're different. Leia's a beta. Look at these paws. Okay, anyway, sorry. Okay, well, I have a 
I have a spooky story for us. And it's one that I actually, I was like, I cannot believe that we have never covered this. It feels like something that we should have covered probably in like the first year of our podcast too. But we haven't. Okay. And that is American Horror Story, the television show. It's haunted? Oh, yeah. And it's arguably, well, it's definitely haunted, but also arguably one of the most fucked up shows on television, right? So it's like, that's for sure. Well, of course it's haunted. I didn't even think about it. But yeah, so if you haven't seen American Horror Story before, it is dark, it is disturbing, it's graphic, it has psychopathic killer clowns, nuclear apocalypses, dark voodoo, burning witches, violent cults, vampire kidnappers, sexual fetishes, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of graphic violence and assault. Yes. It is like, I would say, Game of Thrones level with what they show in terms of violence. Yeah, but it's like present day, so it's not a period piece. Mm -hmm. And it moves a lot quicker than Game of Thrones as well. But I'm like, I can't. I mean, I still like the show, but I'm like, I cannot believe that we all watched this. Like, I remember sitting in my college house every single week, sitting on the couch and like watching it live when it would come on TV because we just couldn't look away. But it's so good. It is good. How many seasons have there been now? The 12th one has been announced. 12 seasons. That's a lot. 12 seasons. Yeah. I think I saw the first four. I think I stopped at Hotel. Hotel. Hotel was great. Based in LA, right over there, right by you. And number four had Lady Gaga in it. So (laughs) it's pretty sweet. That was the like reality TV show Roanoke one, right? Well, no, she she was first in Hotel and then Roanoke was, I think, season five and she did Roanoke after. Okay. So then I did see five. Okay. So yeah. So basically American Horror Story, it's a television show. FX is the production company and Ryan Murphy is the producer. Yeah, I think he has a reputation of coming out with a lot of like spooky, scary, gruesome content. And then also a lot of like true crime type of stuff. Yes. Yes. But the TV show, it's an American horror anthology TV series. So basically each season acts as a mini series. So each season has a complete new set of characters, a new setting, a new universe, a new storyline. But they utilize a lot of the same actors from the previous season. So you might be seeing Emma Roberts, Sarah Paulson. Exactly. Yeah. Jessica Lange. So many of them. And what's interesting, too, is like these people are so incredible acting because you really do. You might have just watched them be play like a ghost in the previous season or like a serial killer. And then the next season they're playing a priest or then they're playing a zombie. And you believe them every time because they're so good. Some notable people, you just named a lot of people who some of them already had fame before American Horror Story, but some of them were, you know, working in the business for a long time without having much recognition. But American Horror Story has totally been a launching pad for so many actors and actresses. And it's also attracted a lot of talent who was already around, like Kathy Bates, Lady Gaga, and even in an episode from the third season, Coven, Stevie Nicks, which is so Uh, cool. So, yes. And then, of course, now I feel like Sarah Paulson's a household name and she... She was someone who'd been in the industry for a long time, but she wasn't a household name until this was like seeing her, her big role. This was her big role. Okay, so the series opened up strong. People were super, super into it. Season one, Murder House. In this season, we meet the Harmon family who's moving from Boston to Los Angeles. They're moving into a new home and Dr. Ben Harmon, he has been cheating on his wife. And his wife, Vivian, who has been cheated on by her husband, there's a lot of tension. They also recently suffered a miscarriage. There's like a lot going on with this family. And then they have a teenage daughter, Violet Thaisa Firminga plays Violet. And Violet befriends and crushes on a boy named Tate, who we all know now is a heartthrob, Evan Peters. Do you think he's a heartthrob? Yes, he so was. He's kind of like, he's one of those, cl- he's, he's like an Edward Cullen for people who are like attracted to people who play characters that are like kind of effed up. Okay, interesting. People have huge, and he was engaged to Emma Roberts. I did know that, but I was wondering if you find him a heartthrob. At the time, I absolutely did, 100%. And he has put in a request, I think to the universe, to the world, to Hollywood, to not play really dark, disturbing characters. He just wants to play like one nice, romantic (laughs) or funny person. Just... Just do a whole series on Dahmer and then be like, hmm, maybe not anymore. No, I mean, he certainly was a heartthrob. And I'd be lying to say I didn't also still think he was a heartthrob. <laughs> anyway, okay. so 
he plays Tate. And there are, those are like basically some of the four main characters. There's a bunch of other characters that come in in season one Murder House. But there are huge twists and turns that you don't see coming. There's commentary on school shootings. There's sexually motivated entities wearing leather suits. And this is one of the most haunted homes to ever make it to network television or be shown on a network television show. It's based on a true house, like a real house in um, L.A. No, but yes. It was filmed in a real house, but it wasn't based on. I thought it was inspired by murder ho- the murder house in Los Angeles. Oh, was it? I thought so. Oh, maybe. Well, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> But I wasn't focused as much on like what they were doing as much as like what was happening when they were doing it. Yes. So with all the conversation about spirits and demons and depression and death, you would wonder why real life spirits and entities wouldn't go haunt the set. And if you're thinking, why the heck didn't they? They did. They most (laughs) certainly did. They made themselves known. And that is why we're talking about it. Yes. And in season one, basically right off the bat, American Horror Story became pretty haunted. So the set wasn't exactly constructed in a studio lot. Later on in different seasons, they did that. But in the very first season, Murder House, it was a very real house. It is, well, a mansion rather. It's in Los Angeles area in the area called Country Club Park. And this mansion was built in the early 1900s by architect Albert Rosenheim. And it is considered a historical monument. And at the time, the area had been called Billionaire Row, so it's only natural that there's been a lot of prominent people who've spent time there. It was owned by some of the richest people, a lot of famous people, actors, celebrities, and it was even a Catholic convent at one point. Oh. So it's it's about 100 years old and seen a lot in that amount of time. That's cool. At the time that American Horror Story was looking to film their very first season, this house was registered as a historic monument, basically so that the current owner could get a huge tax break and restore, the city would then say like, okay, we'll give you a tax break and then you get to restore this house because it was it was like in disarray. It really had, it went from being this like beautiful house on billionaire row to just a dilapidated house, mansion, yeah. I guess. Without TLC, they fall into disarray. Totally. Question, if you re- if it becomes a historical building, does the city have responsibility to help? Well, I think the city's responsibility is basically lowering your taxes so that you have more money to restore it, but you gotcha. have a certain amount of time to restore the property. There's so many. If anyone's interested in doing anything like this and, and looking into a property like this, there are so many properties that I see go for sale in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maine, so many in Maine. I feel like you're trying to get me to move to the East Coast again. <laughs> That's a subtle hint, yeah. hint, Sabrina. Mm, do you want to move to Maine and restore an old mansion on the coast? Well, you Honestly. can because they will give it to you at a, at a lower price and basically like help you out with give you a break on taxes. But you are time bound. It's like you have to fix A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. This whole list of stuff within three years or five years or whatever they give you. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and then I don't know if it's still considered like what parameters are included or forced upon you like down the road if you complete the restoration, if you, if the property remains a historic monument or if you have to pay all your taxes and (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'm not sure. (laughs) Tax evasion with two girls, one ghost. I'm trying to figure it out, man. (laughs) I'm trying (laughs) to restore one of these houses. Loopholes. How long are they going to help you out? As little as they can. Let me tell you that. Yeah. Okay. So because it was registered as a historic monument, this person who was currently owning the house, he had, he was responsible for more than $250,000 worth of tasks, basically, like things to restore. So- It was a very expensive restoration project. I don't think he was getting very far. I think there was a lot of pushback from the city. Yeah, because then you still have to get permits. You still have to get all of that stuff. Totally. And so when FX came and they were like, hey, we have a show, American Horror Story. We would love to film it here. Obviously, we would pay to film at your house. He was like, ooh, this will surely offset some of the costs of these repairs. So a win-win situation. And so that is how they found themselves, American Horror Story, found themselves in this house in Los Angeles. They shot Murder House in this actual house. The plot of Murder House was dark, it was depraved, it was convoluted, and apparently very entertaining for the spirits. Because while it was said that this place at the time was vacant from spirits before they started filming Murder House, 
American Horror Story certainly left the Rosenheim Mansion haunted. I wonder if they were quiet or if the person was not in tune with them, if they weren't living in the house because it was in disarray, so they didn't like have any interactions with the spirits, or if just the content of the show basically brought Churned. the house to life. Yep. Well, knowing what I know and what I'll, what I'm about to tell you, I think that there was stuff in there before, for sure. Okay. And I think that it was probably just one of those things where people just put up their blinders and was like, no, that person tickling my toes is definitely not dead. I'm imagining it, you know? And they're like, it wasn't haunted. It was. It's just a strange dream. Just a very strange dream. Yeah. No, I think it was definitely haunted. But... Four years after Murder House aired, the house was sold for $3.2 million. And then in 2018, the owners sued the previous owners who had owned it during American Horror Story filming. They sued the previous owners. For what? They sued Coldwell Banker and they sued the brokers, claiming that they failed to disclose that this house was a macabre tourist attraction because they said hundreds of American Horror Story fans would show up at their home and some would even try to break in. And so they were like, we aren't safe and we weren't told this. Oh, that sucks. They said, in addition, the previous owner hadn't completed all of the required repairs to the property. And lastly, the mansion is haunted. And they were not told that there were ghosts haunting this place. Okay, couple things. If it's that popular of a house where people are like coming at all times of the day and night to come look at it, I imagine you can Google the address and it would come up as the American Horror Story house. Yeah, you would think people would give a Google, but I don't think they did. I feel like that's a little bit on them. Did they win this lawsuit? Are you going to tell us? I don't think they did. No, I think it was dropped. Okay. Yeah. It's hard because I feel like part of me is like, well, if they went and saw the house at an open house and they saw a bunch of people around, it could just be like, oh, the curiosity of people seeing this historic home during an open house. And then also, you know, they spent over $3 million. Yes, they should have Googled it. But I also understand if you're spending a lot of money, you put a lot of trust also in the person who is helping you find a house, tell you all the things about that house, since that's a lot of money. Right. I don't know what happened or what went wrong. All I know is that in 2018, they were like, we are suing you because there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of safety issues. And this place is riddled with ghosts. So (laughs) it's interesting because it's actually very similar. Like their situation is very similar to what happened in the season Murder House. So it was extremely ironic because in the first season, the house called Murder House is called that because of what happened there and then becomes a tourist attraction like in the actual television show American Horror Story, which that's fiction, but in real life, now the house has become a tourist attraction. And then in the show, the broker has a hard time selling it because of its reputation. And then they find out that their house is haunted. And this is very, very similar to sort of like what is happening to these people now. So it was just weird that it all kind of like came full circle and almost the story that they were telling almost became the true story of the house after they filmed it the real story yeah is it kind of like how the simpsons tell the future oh my god matt groaning is a time traveler (laughs) (laughs) convinced has to be okay so to my knowledge the lawsuit didn't really go anywhere because the brokers had no clue that it was haunted and so they weren't liable for disclosing that information and all of the other stuff got taken care of but in the years since the lawsuit the new owners angela oakenfold and husband dr ernst von schwartz have started to come around to this house being haunted angela said that when they first got the home they were not aware of its reputation obviously we know that because of the lawsuit nor did they pick up on any paranormal activity but they were like this is our dream home it's so beautiful we have to have it Wait, okay, so the family still lives there? No, but yes. <laughs> huh? Huh? They spend time there, but they don't live there full time. But I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I mean, they bought the home. Right. I wasn't sure if they sold it. Oh, no. So, sorry. I was. I meant like they came around to owning the home and now they're maybe into having this spooky gotcha. home. But basically, they okay. weren't aware of it. They were like, this is beautiful. This is so dreamy. We feel so good in here. So they bought the home. And then when they moved in and when the old owners moved out, the old owners then sent this sort of ominous email that said, well, I don't know how the line from the email is ominous on its own, but I don't know what other context was included in this email. But the previous owner sent them an email that said, the only thing that will be left are the ghosts. And so these people are like, 
what is this a joke like are they trying to be funny like what is going on and so since then since i got that email they started to do some more research on the house that they were now moved into now that i'm hearing about this email i'm like it sounds like the previous owners are pretty out like forthcoming about the ghost but maybe they waited until like keys were passed over everything was fine yeah i don't know I don't know where that went wrong or what was it. I mean, do you have to disclose it in California? I can't remember. I don't know. Probably not. Most states you don't. But anyway, so they were told that and they were like, "Uh uh-oh, what is going on? Yeah, what does that mean? We have since learned about ghostly experiences that these new owners have encountered because they have started doing interviews. They've done live streams. And the next accounts that I'm about to tell you are from an interview that Angela did with too fab. It seems like while they were perhaps not pleased with how everything went down, they got to a point where they were like, oh, well, now we can make money from this. This is yes. a good investment. I think so. And also, I think there's two parts of this. I think one, they like kind of came around to it. Two, they were no longer living full time in the house because they did eventually move out of it and just turned it into more of an investment property. And three, they came up with some solutions to kind of like appease the American Horror Story fans while keeping it a little bit safer and more private, if that makes sense. So they did a bunch of things. But the very first night that they move in, Angela and Ernst, they move into this new mansion, this $3 million mansion, and they go to bed. It's so exciting. The first night in their new forever home. And then they wake up at 1 a.m. to a huge bang in the room right below them. The loud bang was then followed with what sounded like someone dragging across the floor. And this happened twice that night. So they were like, oh my gosh, something is seriously wrong. This isn't just like the house settling. So they call the police. The cops come and they go through the entire house. A helicopter was even circling above and they see no one. There are no intruders, no signs of forced entry. All of the doors and the windows are still closed and locked. There was literally no way anyone could be in there. When getting work done on the house later on, workers began to have experiences of their own in this murder house. There were people working on the utilities in the house, basically. Some people were there installing the cable and also installing a security system, and they were down in the basement doing all the wiring and all of that. One of the guys said that he felt like he had been touched, and he felt a really strange feeling in the basement. Another worker was so overcome by those strange feelings that he ran up the stairs and said to the owners, it's evil down there. I can't work. It's evil down there. It's evil. They were certainly on to something because soon the spirits would make physical contact with the owners. So previously, up until this point, they just heard strange noises, been woken in the middle of the night, but they hadn't been touched or felt, I guess, like they were in any harm's way. But Ernst, Angela's husband, he was startled when he felt someone tap him on the shoulder. And then this misty feminine shadow floated in front of him for about five seconds and then faded away. Which also is very reminiscent of season one. Mm-hmm. Because there are some flirty spirits. Oh, yeah. Yeah, perhaps she was in a little, like, maid's outfit. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it would seem that anyone who enters the home is at risk of encountering one of the spirits because other people have also reported having encounters in this home. People have heard a young girl crying in grief. They've heard marching. And they've even seen an apparition of a butler on the staircase. This phantom butler was also seen by the previous owner's daughter and is likely one of the contributing factors to the very ominous email that like, all you have left is the ghosts. <laughs> so obviously they had experiences. If they had experiences before American Horror Story or if that was after the filming, I do not know. But all I know now is is that Angela and Ernst, the new owners, were encountering a lot. They also have children. One of their children was three years old, and then the twins were just born, and they noticed how often their three-year-old was looking up at things and talking to people who weren't present, and not knowing or really trusting who was there and what, how many spirits or what the spirits were intending to do, they were like, ooh, uh, well, given how much people have said the basement doesn't give off good vibes, despite us not feeling like we're being threatened, this probably is not the best home for us to raise our kids in. And so I don't know where they moved to, but they do not live in this house full time anymore. Gotcha. 
I am. So it's interesting because it doesn't sound like, yes, they were definitely perplexed by the fact it was haunted, but it sounds like they accepted that it was haunted pretty quickly. They didn't yeah. have any skepticism about it. So although it was like three or four years between the lawsuit and them actually purchasing the house, which is I'm curious what happened in that time. If it was just like such a buildup that they were like, OK, we have to this is must have not felt safe. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I guess like there's. American Horror Story gained so much traction. And with it being the first season, it's a season that everyone who's seen the show remembers, you know? Right, right. If it were like season four, you probably would get away with, you know, a year or two of a lot of people going and seeing that site and then kind of forgetting about it. Moving on. Yeah. It is one of those things that like stories like this make me want our podcast to have like an interview portion where we could get in touch with everyone. I know. But because we release every freaking week, that takes a long time to if we had a whole production team <laughs> that handles everything maybe yeah but that's, that i mean i guess that's what we're starting to do with our haunted with we're trying to do it yeah a version of it for sure a yeah. monthly version exactly okay so angela does feel that the house and the spirits have good vibes as a whole so despite a lot of people saying that the basement is evil that it's creepy that they hear all these weird things they feel threatened and that there's this like ominous energy and buzz going off they're like We don't think anyone here is trying to kill us or harm us. They said that other people have come into the house and basically immediately noped it right out. But they they don't feel that. It's also important to note. So we were just talking earlier at like the top of this episode about how the daughter in season one murder house is played by Thaisa Formiga. She plays Violet. Yeah. Thaisa Formiga also plays the main character in The Conjuring Movie 2 in the, the nun one and her older sister plays Lorraine Warren in the first conjuring house and also plays the mom in Bates Motel. So it might be them. It might be them. <laughs> I mean, they are horror movie actresses. So, yeah. So she, when she was filming in the murder house, she said that she, she does get scared easily, but she was like, there were some scenes in the basement that scared me so much. And during the pilot episode, she said she was so terrified that there, there was actual terror running through her body, like full fight or flight. Which probably worked well with the acting. Totally. Yeah. She wasn't acting (laughs) in that scene. She didn't have to. No. So while Angela and her husband also say there's no bad vibes, we have numerous people saying that there are some weird vibes going on some type of vibes and the home also had previously an exorcism done long before american horror story was ever there is this when it was a convent yes makes sense so when it moved from a private residence to a nunnery a priest came and exercised the house before the nuns moved in digging into the home's history a bit more there is some suspicion that american horror story may have never led to the hauntings but surely contributed to it because the original owner and architect, Albert Rosenheim, he built the house for himself and his family, but he left after just a few years. Why he left, I don't know, but I feel like the the spooky side of us wants to believe that there was something scary that made them leave. Yeah, the ghosts didn't want him there. Yes. And then the wealthiest man in California at the time, he bought the house and he started renting it out for a few decades to actors and celebrities, no one spending much time in it. But again, that could also just be because they're celebrities and actors and have different things going on but it contributed to the lore of like oh my gosh people just didn't stay in here very long then he just donates it to the catholic church the church exercises the house so here i guess this is where like if we had phone a friend i could call a priest and say is it normal that you would exercise a house and not just bless it like why did you choose to exercise it? exercise unless they believed like i don't know this is just my logic working through potential reasons is like if it's going from a house that housed celebrities who potentially like lived a in the eyes of the church harder salacious Mm -hmm. party life it was like more of like a rather than just blessing it it needed a complete yeah that, that makes sense especially in the time Because when it was being converted, there was a lot of partying going on back then. Yeah. And exorcism is like a massive cleanse. It's just like a more extreme version. Yeah. Okay. So Angela says that this house has brought her family good luck. Oh. They had been having a lot of trouble getting pregnant before moving into this house. And almost immediately after moving into the mansion, they conceived and got to start their family. 
And it was only when their then three-year-old. Isn't that an American Horror Story thing, too, in the first season? Was it in the first season? There was, but maybe it was like different. It wasn't that they were having trouble conceiving, but there was a conception thing. Well, they had a miscarriage. That was part of the storyline. But I don't know yeah. if there was another. I don't know. I don't know. Now I need to go rewatch it. Wasn't it like the latex suit guy? <laughs> oh, God. The latex suit guy was... He was scary. Now I really want to rewatch it. I know. Me too. The latex suit guy was awful, but what was even worse was if you watch American Horror Story Hotel that season, that creature that has like the this penetration thing that is really disturbing and gross and kills people. Ugh. Okay. But here's a fun story that I was just reading in my research. I didn't write it down. But since you brought up the latex suit, so Evan Peters would be in the latex suit. Hubba hubba. The latex <laughs> suit, it was like kind of like chaps, like his butt would show and he said when he was first filming in the latex suit first of all he would have to put like basically a lube all over his body to get into this really uncomfortable suit to get into the suit and then he thought that there was like a a scene where i think like jessica lang had to like slap his butt or something and he was like bent over and so he thought at the time that if he just put like a sock over his penis his shaft that it would all be good and covered. He didn't understand the extent of which his body would be like contorted in the scene. And so apparently when he did that Of course that you scene read this story. And like <laughs> bent over, his balls were just fully exposed to all of the cast and everybody. And he said he didn't realize until Sarah Paulson walked over to him and gave him a little kiss on the cheek <laughs> and walked away like to try to make him less embarrassed. I'm like, for me, that's like, how did the costume department not think of that and think ahead for Yeah. Like him. you put everything in this, not just parts of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Oh, man. Okay, so Angela and and her husband, they got to start their family. That was super exciting. And they're like, you know, as much as we've had some difficulties, we initially had the lawsuit going on, like we've had a lot of people come and kind of threaten our own safety and security. This house has brought a lot of healthy, happy moments to us. That's nice. And so they were like, we just happen to be sharing this house with dead people, but we don't (laughs) want to share it so much so that our three-year-old is socializing with ghosts constantly. And so they did move out. But to deter the American Horror Story fans from breaking in or attempting any more satanic rituals in their yard, which apparently had happened multiple times, they put up a very large wire fence around the property and have hosted a live stream to give fans a glimpse of the home in a way that is safe for the family and safe for viewers. I was saying that in 2020, they set up, I think it was their very first Halloween live stream. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And they had like stuff set up in the basement, like there's this whole thing going. And I read that they were giving the proceeds to, or at least a percentage of it, to Baby to Baby. So they were using it as a charity event as well, which was really lovely. That is really nice. But when they were prepping for this Halloween live stream to kind of like give people a glimpse into the house, scratch that itch for the American Horror Story fans and horror fans, they created a little promotional trailer. The director who films that promotional trailer refused to come back for the actual live stream he said that he most certainly brought something home with him after filming the (gasps) promo he said he was laying in bed when he suddenly became aware of something at the end of his bed he called his friend to come over and to help him cleanse his space and the dog that was accompanying his friend his friend's dog i said that weird his friend's dog (laughs) who came over went absolutely crazy when entering this man's apartment and so he was like no I am not interested in coming back in and filming in this house. So everyone seemed to be horribly haunted. It's interesting how, I mean, maybe it depends on the personality of these people, but like how some people who go into the house leave so quickly and are so terrified and so disturbed by what they experience that they're like, I'm never coming back. Whereas this family, they were experiencing quite a bit, but they seem to come to terms. I don't know. It's just interesting how, like, I wonder if the spirit's, don't like certain people and they are extra spooky to them to try to keep them out or if it's just the type of person who you know doesn't want to believe in the paranormal and so when they experience it they're like absolutely not not going back there again right yeah it is weird maybe it's because it does seem like people who come and go get most of the bad experiences but anyone who actually lives there gets probably some of the good experiences like i mean not that it's a good experience to wake up to a thud and a body dragging against your floor (laughs) but like 
it's better than being they they never feel any of like the dark energy or like they don't have people chilling at the end of their bed and creeping them out it's just like someone floating by a quick tap one of my least favorite things about hosting is how to get everyone to leave are you doing the broom thing Right. But uh, not everyone understands that that is a sign. Get the fuck out. So, you know, you spend all day prepping when you host and you do a big dinner party or whatever it is you're having people over for. And it's you. it takes a lot of energy and it's fun for me, at least. And but then sometimes people by like, you know, I get tired at the end of the night. I like to sleep and people linger. If I lived in a haunted house, I would I'd either like work it out with the spirits and be like, hey, at 1030 11 do something spooky kick the people out or i tell everyone my house is haunted but like the ghosts are fine like come on over and then at like 10 30 11 i have it set somehow that all the power goes out and so people (laughs) are freaked out and they're like they have to leave and the second they leave power's back on oh my gosh blame it on the ghost it would work for some people but i feel like if that other people like i feel like if i did that and you were at the party at my house you'd be like well now i'm spending the night because i'm investigating what's going on here (laughs) yeah but at least then i'd be like i'm gonna go excuse myself to a bedroom corinne would you like to go to sleep you can Uh, gosh you need to get one of those banners that just says like please leave by nine but just edit it like please leave by 10 30 just put it up every single time you have people it's just a standard set your boundary now everyone giggles when they walk in and then when it's time 10 30 you're like oh mm, the banner it says sorry not my rule it's the banner's rule well i have a friend whose family is like that but theirs is like 7 30 p.m you are out and they are explicit with it there's there's no banner it is like see ya what time does the party start they do early dinner oh i feel like it's a quick event Yes. Very, very quick. 6 to 7.30. At least you know. <laughs> you know when yeah. you go over there. 7.30, you're out. Okay, so everybody seems pretty haunted who comes in here. And the new owners have plenty of hauntings too, yet they feel their existence there is more of a peaceful coexistence. And they've come around so much to the ghosts that live in this house that they have allowed American Horror Story to return and film in the house for a few more episodes. Oh, really? There were scenes from this house filmed for Hotel, for Roanoke, and for Apocalypse all those seasons. And basically, FX came to these new owners and they were like, we want to film just like, you know, some short scenes at the house. And they were like, ooh, no thank you. We are not interested (laughs) in that. You guys have caused plenty of trouble for, for our house right as it is. But then American Horror Story was like, well, Lady Gaga's in this season. And then the owners were like, oh, never mind. In the pot. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I would do the same thing. So essentially, the first season came off strong, either getting into an already haunted house or exacerbating it or simply adding in a few more spirits. But this would not be the last time that the show dabbled in the dark, the real darkness. Season three, Coven. It takes place in 2013, New Orleans. So it follows a coven of witches and their interactions with their friends and their enemies, including Madame Delphine Lalaurie and Marie Laveau. It is one of the best seasons of the show, in my opinion. It is my favorite season. It's so good. Oh, to live in a house with your coven. Yeah. It it, it, honestly, because we were doing the podcast at that time. Uh, Mm -hmm. No, maybe we weren't. Were we? Wait, what? No, I think it. Oh, predates you know the what? podcast. It definitely predates the podcast. But I remember watching that and being like, I, what do I need to do to go back in time and become a witch like this? Like, oh my gosh. I want to be sent away from home because I'm so freaking powerful that I need to go to a boarding school home for witches in New Orleans. It's it's just so cool. And everyone wears the costumes in that. They were just so cool. Yes. I was envious of oh, every single outfit. The music. It just shows you how all black and how those like jewel tones and how how just amazing costumes can be. The music was amazing. Everything was so good. So witchy. So good. So incredible. Oh, but it was haunted. <laughs> Gabri Sidibe, who I first saw in Precious. She plays the character Precious, if anyone's seen that movie. She played Queenie who was a basically like a human voodoo doll who was torn between sides and could both enter and exit the astral plane, but like not even really the astral plane. It was like almost like she could enter death and then return from it So in her astral state. So (laughs) Gabri, they were all filming some pretty 
graphic and dark scenes. But her character, Queenie, had quite a few scenes. I would argue probably more graphic scenes than anyone else in that show. She had this really disturbing incubus, bestiality, horned demon sex scene. If anyone's seen it and remembers that. Why don't I remember this? You don't remember that? It was, okay, so it was like, no. God, what happened? It was something like Delphine Lollery. She, I might be butchering this because this is, this came out like what, seven, 10 years ago? I don't know. But my memory is that Lollery had murdered an enslaved man and he came back to enact his revenge on her. And he was wearing the head of like a, it was almost like a goat head. It was like, he had horns. It was like a bison's head. Oh, see, that also reminds me of Lady Gaga in um, Roanoke. Oh, yeah. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen American Horror Story, just watch it. If you're, well, it's if you're so prepared. good. It's so good, but it's also like very graphic. But it's so good. Just know. I'm also thinking now about to. Coven, like that season, the amount of things that happen. There's like murder. There's like Frankenstein. There's um, the axe murderer. Like there's just so many things, so going, many things. that happen. They like wow, literally okay. watch someone get burned alive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. It's love that it's actress too. Brutal. She's so good. Okay, so they all film really dark scenes, but she Queenie Queenie's character, or the character Queenie, she had to film a lot. In the episode called "Go to Hell," Queenie chants a Latin phrase that will summon Papa Legba the gatekeeper to the spirit world. Papa Legba is a very real figure in West African beliefs and Haitian voodoo. And so Gabri, am I saying her name right? Gabri? Gabri. Gabri, who played Queenie, already had some reluctance about the scene because she was like, I don't want to actually call upon him and disturb the spirit of this guy, this entity. This right, because they're using the actual words. Yeah, so I don't think she was fully aware of that. I think she kind of trusted or rather assumed that the Latin prayer written into her script was at least altered a little bit to be written more for television and not just an exact prayer to summon the spirit. But it was not. It was very much yeah, this say. Latin prayer to summon yeah. this guy whose name, I don't want to keep saying his name. So I'll call him PL. Can you say it one more time? The third time? Fine, don't. Okay, I'll say it one third time. Papa Legba. Sorry, one more time? <laughs> no! <laughs> okay. So she is now filming and there is a Latin prayer written into her script to summon PL. The cameras are rolling and Gabri or Queenie began to chant and the light fixtures in the room began to shake. Oh, and this is real. Like this is not part of this is real. stage work. Okay. Yep. So then they, they yell, cut, scene is done, angle's good. We need to film the scene again. New angle. They move the cameras and they get a new angle, a new side of Queenie and action. Queenie has to chant again this Latin prayer calling out for PL. And this time the light fixture comes crashing down to the floor. I'm sorry, but no one paused after the first instance of the light flashing, flickering and was like, what's going on? No, no. And so then you would think that they'd yell cut and then move on. But instead they did not. They're like, start again. So it's like, come again, start again. What? That's right. Cameras keep rolling. Shooting is resuming. It doesn't matter that light fixtures have flickered and now that they're crashing down to the floor. They keep going. We have to keep doing it. Uh, Honestly, then it makes me think that there's so much happening on this set that this is just not unusual. It's just, yeah, there's, oh my God. This time, Gabri feels a phantom finger move up her chin and to her lip. And then her lip begins to swell. So this time, they yell cut and Gabri has to be, I mean, her lips are swelling. So this is kind of a medical emergency, it seems, or a medical event, at least. So she is brought back to her makeup trailer, and she's waiting for a medic. It is her and a makeup artist sitting in there together when the two of them suddenly hear scratching, loud, hard, scratch, 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 outside of the trailer like someone is trying to get in. So Gabri, she turns to the makeup artist, and she says, pray, pray right now. And they both just start praying. They're praying. They're praying. They're Gabri's not praying in that Latin prayer. She's praying some sort of Hell like no. godly. Whatever Catholic she believes prayer. in. 
Yes, she is praying for protection. And as they're praying together, the noises stop. When she's finally done with filming that day and gets to go home from set, she calls her Catholic friend who equips her with this devil banishing prayer, teaches her this prayer. Only once this prayer is spoken and she's talking to her very Catholic friend, does all of the swelling subside from her lip and things are peaceful once again. Thank goodness she has this friend to like help her. I know, right? Thank goodness it worked. <laughs> yeah. She was a bit frustrated still. She was like, okay, well, there was nothing else that happened on set, at least to her. But she was still pretty frustrated with, I guess, like the cast and crew because right. because everyone would joke with her about what happened, about her like summoning PL. And she was like, you guys, like you have to stop talking about it. You have to understand that your power is in your words and you need to take it seriously. But all was peaceful until the final episode of Coven. It was the 13th episode, the last episode in the season, and the Latin prayer would, which previously haunted Gabri, was back in the script. Have you not learned? They haven't, because if you remember, this time, it wasn't just the character Queenie who chanted it, it was the entire cast who chanted it together, the coven of witches. So standing there amongst her castmates, chanting and calling out to this spirit, Gabri finds herself once more stepping out of her character of Queenie because she feels a finger run from her forehead down her face to the top of her lip again. And her lip swells. It's so freaky that it's like keeps coming back to her mouth. It's like, I just imagine like a long nail, like someone standing next to her going, hello, pretty. It also makes me curious. I'm like, is there something that's touching her lip to basically be like, I like what you're saying, like keep calling to me? Or is it kind of like a gentle warning, like don't say much more because you don't know what you're calling for? To me, it seems like my precious, like keep saying it. Like, I love you. Mm -hmm. You're my little... My puppet. My puppet. Well, her lips were swollen and she was definitely afraid. Her colleague, Thaisa Formiga, who was experiencing some bad vibes in season one Murder House, she was also in season three. She played Zoe Benson. She was one of the witches in the coven. And at the time of filming, she was living in this old warehouse in Los Angeles that was turned into loft apartments. And there was nothing odd about her new apartments. But when she got to work that day, that morning before filming the scene, Emma Roberts was like, hey, are you scared? And Thaisa's like, what? Why? Scared of what? And Emma's like, we're filming the scene, the one that opened up Gabri, and we're all filming it. We're all chanting it in Latin. So then the rest of them get to the scene. You know, Gabri, we know what happens to her. But when Thaisa finishes this scene, when she gets home that night, it's a little after 2 a.m., and she's already on edge because of what happened earlier that day with her co-worker, Gabri, like fighting off this entity. And she's also remembering her sister, Vera, who plays Lorraine Warren in The Conjuring movie, which was also being filmed around this time, had recently told her about the witching hour and how at 3 a.m. it's considered the witching hour and some of the things that could happen during that time. So she's like, oh, my God, it's 2 a.m., I just said all these Latin prayers. I need to go to sleep immediately. So she lays down in bed and she's drifting off. And then suddenly she's wide awake. Her eyes still shut, but her whole body is alert. Her ears perk up. She can hear someone walking. She can hear the wood creaking below their feet. She keeps her eyes closed and eventually she starts to drift a little bit closer to sleep again, only to wake up fully alert. The cover is now being pulled off of her. She lunges for the light and she turns it on and no one is there. She stays awake the entire night. And then the next night she sleeps downstairs and whatever was in her home apparently left her left her alone after that. So that was her one experience after saying that Latin prayer. It's almost like a little bit of a warning. Mm. Like I know where you live. Absolutely. Definitely. Ah. So there has been a lot of bad energy and hauntings associated with American Horror Story, which has been renewed for another season, TBD, when it's going to come out. But this is a reminder that we should all take a page out of Kathy Bates' book, who was in numerous seasons of American Horror Story and was notorious for playing very deeply dark and disturbing characters. Uh, Annie Wilkes. In her time as an actress, yes. She 
Oh, Will, uh, use an axe on your legs to keep you there forever. Uh, she has a daily detox ritual to rid herself of all the bad juju associated with her characters. She said, quote, when I take off my costume and my makeup, I visualize and remove all the negative energy from myself. It is an important process to let go and to say, it's not me. It's someone else. That's beautiful. This is me ending the episode or this portion of the episode reminding us all to rid ourselves of the negative energy, to remember that our words have power to set good intentions, especially during this month when we are much, much closer to the spirit world. And they much closer to us. Oh, yeah. So those are just a few of the hauntings that have been publicly discussed from American Horror Story. Thank you for sharing these because this is so fascinating and... I feel like it is such an iconic show that so many people know about it. It does make me wonder if Scream Queens was haunted because it was kind of like a spinoff, also very ghostly, murdery. Yeah, some of the same characters. Same characters. Or actors. actors. And then I guess I have a couple thoughts. One, how fun would it be to do like a rewatch of American Horror Story and like discuss it? Oh, it would be so good. I wonder yeah. if there's a podcast out there that already does that because there's so many like rewatching. Yeah, yeah, rewatching podcasts. Should we do one? But if not, nose goes. TM. Nose goes to us. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> nose goes to us deciding to rewatch a show and talk about it because no one else can do that. <laughs> um, no one ever thought of that. Uh, not like there's a hundred podcasts out there that do that. That could be our fun like Patreon book club like that we do quarterly. We do like instead of just books, we could do this quarter we all rewatch first mm. season of American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. And then it makes me wonder how many stories and encounters of things that happened on set that we don't know that people haven't shared. It kind of sounds like also I low key love Emma Roberts and when MySpace was a thing, I commented on her MySpace and she responded and she I was did? I really thought, yeah, it was one of those like parasocial relationships where I was like we're best friends now. And so because of that, I very much like have a silly relationship like with my fascination with Emma Roberts, but also based on her character that she plays in a lot of the seasons, I'm like, I kind of love the idea that she was stirring the pot a little bit to Thaisa was like, aren't you scared? Oh, she was. I mean, Thaisa literally blamed it. She was like, I don't even know if this was a real haunting like existing in my apartment because of the scene or strictly because Emma scared her. (laughs) Yeah. She's like, because she's trying to open me up and scare me. (laughs) Yeah, she yeah. she and fully it blamed it in the article I was reading about her. Okay, well, it worked. It worked. And now I'm also realizing that I've seen way more seasons because I think I saw one. I saw two was the asylum, right? We'll go through we'll go through the seasons right now. So season one, murder house. Mm-hmm. Season two, asylum. Mm-hmm. So that's based in like a Massachusetts asylum. Three yeah. is coven. Four so, is yeah. freak show. Oh, that one was good. Five is hotel. Okay. Six is Roanoke. Love. Seven is cult. Oh, I think I stopped at cult. I did too. I was like four episodes into cult and I stopped. Yeah. But cult was the one where they started to tie the seasons together. Oh, did they? Yeah. And I think that they were like trying to, I don't know how they were trying to do it, but like they were winking at previous seasons and almost like parallel universe type of things. Yeah. Cult was similar very characters. political and there was a lot of like mass shootings and it was yeah. really hard for me to watch. Was that, that the one. bunker one? Is that kind no, of no? That's where they start apocalypse. That's that's number eight. Did you see season eight? Okay, I didn't finish it, so I must have like started. I've been like, okay, well, I'll try this one because You're like, they are I've seen all three seasons. You've seen eight. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen probably like five full seasons. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah. eight is apocalypse. Nine is 1984. Ten is double feature. Eleven is New York City, and twelve is called delicate which is to be to be announced when it will be released i would give the ones that i haven't seen a watch i would yeah yeah i might skip colt and go to apocalypse okay let's do it okay all right what email do you have i have one actually sent to us very recently and kind of perfect timing serendipitous if you may this is from our listener steven And it's called When You Use an Insane Asylum as a Movie Set. Mm. Hello, Corinne and Sabrina. 
First of all, I want to say how much I love your podcast, especially loved your collaboration with National Parks After Dark, as I got to hear two really awesome podcasts at the same time and hope that you both do another collab again soon. (laughs) Anyway, my name is Steven, and I think from a young age, I had occasionally, but not often, seen things of a supernatural nature. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, can we talk about my like little baby in a blanket in my arms? When do you have, when do you have to part ways with Soot? Alejandra's coming to meet her on Thursday. Oh my gosh, so soon. But then she still has to get neutered and stuff, so I think. Oh yeah, be... well, and we leave in two weeks, so. <laughs> yeah, so soon. Okay, mostly just seeing things I couldn't explain, like blobs of energy or entities floating through my room at night. And as a young adult, these experiences were even less frequent, but became a bit darker in nature. The worst of which was ongoing sleep paralysis, which was absolutely terrifying, and I hope one day I have the courage to write it to you. Then, as an adult, it thinned out and almost to nothing, except for the occasional hot, cold spell with shivers when entering a place that I suspected was haunted. Also, as an adult, I think I had dismissed my previous experiences as not possibly being real and maybe the product of my overactive imagination. I realized I was always alone when I had my experiences, so I started to think it must have been all in my head. See, this is the thing that happens though, is when people try to like rationalize things, they like try yeah. they basically try to say like, oh, it's me. I've gone a bit crazy. Right. It's also hard too as you get older looking back at things and like rewriting them. I feel like I rewrite some of my happy memories with anxiety over them and i'm like well he wasn't feeling anxious in that moment it's i'm anxious now and i'm thinking about that moment so that's not actually what happened it's hard to like remind yourself of the actual facts and not second guess yourself memories are hard man Mm -hmm. the brain is also such a powerful thing that you can totally rewrite yes and then reconvince your past okay i say almost nothing happened because this story is of an encounter i had as an adult with what is commonly referred to on your show as a shadow person after years of not having any activity. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I work in the film industry or what is often commonly referred to as Hollywood North. As it so happens, my story takes place while I was working on a movie set here in Vancouver when we were shooting at a location known as Riverview Hospital. The hospital and its grounds, which were closed back in 2012, are frequently used for filming and in fact, holds the title as the most filmed location in Canada. It has been featured in many movies and TV shows due to its institutional style buildings that date back to the 1930s. Before it was a popular filming destination, Riverview Hospital had already had quite a disturbing and notorious 100 years of history. Formerly, it was a psychiatric facility slash insane asylum where many patients were subjected to treatments barbaric by today's standards, such as electric shock therapy, forced sterilization, lobotomies, etc. As you can imagine, just the thought of being there, let alone filming in such a creepy place, made me feel super creeped out already. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up just thinking about walking through the corridors with the overgrown vines taking over the windows. Sounds kind of beautiful though, doesn't it? It does. (laughs) There, There are some pictures too we can put into the video an uneasy feeling when walking past rooms with scaly peeling walls that were used as dormitories or areas with bathtubs still intact and some rooms that looked like operating theaters all alluding to its disturbing past as we typically work long hours on a film set we have what is known as craft service where you can go anytime to grab yourself a snack or a cup of coffee since this one scene required a lot of background actors and crew alike there was not a lot of room left inside the cafeteria building we were shooting in So the craft service table had to be set up downstairs in the dark, eerie basement. Of course. Which apparently is rumored to have a secret tunnel to the hospital morgue. It was lit only by a single lamp by the lighting department that they had kindly provided. (laughs) That's so funny. Of course. I feel bad for the crafty team who has to sit down there all day. I know. We had started setting up for a shot that was taking a long time, so I took the opportunity along with four or five of my fellow crew members to go to craft service. We all made our way down to the basement to see what selection of sandwiches and snacks were at hand. We poured ourselves cups of coffee and stood around in a circle chatting away. 
I was facing away from the table towards some of the other crew that were there. My eyes were squinting a little from the flare of the light that was beaming slightly into my eyes, which made the room seem a little bit more ominous. While everyone was chatting away, I started to feel the hairs on the back of my neck tingling, and I felt that hot, cold, shivering sensation. Then, it was as if everyone's voices started to fade away and time began to slow. As I saw a full-bodied, shadowy figure from head to toe as it stepped out from a wall into the room no less than 20 feet in front of me. Oh my gosh, the fact that it stepped out of a wall, I feel like they always just appear, but it's actively coming from somewhere. And for Steven. Yeah. Oh, Steven! I couldn't make out a face, but I could make out a gray silhouette of a wiry man that I could see right through. At first, it didn't notice us as it cautiously took a few steps further into the room. I think my mouth must have dropped open as I stared out into nothing while holding my coffee in hand. Everyone else just continued on with their conversations completely unaware of everything. And I thought to myself, this can't be real. It has to be in my head. Just then, the shadowy figure froze in its path, turned its head, and looked right towards me as if it had just noticed us and had been caught by surprise. I can tell you now, my heart must have skipped a beat and I just stood there frozen, sweating with a gulp of terror as our eyes locked in gaze. It then turned away and ran right across the room at a breakneck speed through a door that was closed and bolted shut on the opposite side of the room. <sighs> I think I just stood there in disbelief, like, what was that? Did I really see this? Or was this place just getting to me? How could everyone else be so oblivious to what just happened? Oh, I must just be crazy. This is, this is exactly what was going through my head. Feeling completely lost in following the conversation everyone else was having, I remained quiet when my friend and work colleague who was standing next to me quietly leaned over and asked if I was okay. I said, I think so, because I didn't want to say that I saw anything. She then quietly and calmly whispered to me, hey, can I ask you something? This is a bit weird, but um, did you, um, did you by chance just see a figure come out from that wall, stop it, look at us, and then run through the door? <laughs> We looked at each other and from the look on my face as all the blood drained out of me, she knew the answer. I don't think we mentioned it again after leaving the basement, but now I know with irrefutable proof, since we had both seen the same thing without me telling her what I saw, it most definitely was real. Years later, we ran into each other on another movie set and we talked for the first time about the experience we both had with a shadowy encounter. I was afraid when I asked her if she remembered what happened that she would be like, what are you talking about? But we both remembered it very vividly, what we saw at the craft service table that day in Riverview Hospital, where I'm sure there are many, many more ghost stories to be told. Thank wow. you for taking the time to read this. I look forward to your next Encounters episode. And if you read it, maybe it will give me the courage to tell you my terrifying sleep paralysis tale. <gasps> Please. Ooh. Bye for now, Steven. And then here are some pictures if you look at the email. Okay. Oh, wow. I'm trying to scroll while holding kitten. Oh, you know. Jeez. We'll add them into the video. Okay. Oh, it was in Deadpool 2 in the background. You can see the building huh? in the background. The last photo, it shows the building on fire in the background oh, yeah. of Deadpool 2. Oh, I feel like it was used for a lot. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my gosh. The, it's just so freaky. I mean, how how daring was that shadow figure, that person, that entity, whatever it was? It was clearly so daring to just, like, walk out and kind of, like, stare at them. And then luckily it was just like, okay, I'm going to keep moving on. It makes me wonder if it didn't realize it was visible, if this is supposed to be more of like a, hey, I'm here too, or like you're in my space. This is a warning. Right. Well, okay. I have two versions or here's my one, one hot, my nicer version of it. I think Steven is very in tune and maybe has shut themselves off quite a bit, mm. but being in a place that is this haunted and has this much history Stephen became more in tune than usual yeah and like that's why time slowed and voices like quieted when something paranormal and like of a paranormal frequency entered the space but the way that Stephen explains it being surprised by their presence it does make me think it was just going about its ghostly business yeah walking through walls you know just like, well, this is the last place I expected you to set up snacks, so my bad. Right. And then 
looked at them, got spooked, and sprinted away. You know, it's not like it got spooked and charged at them. Right. Still is such a spooky. I'd be like, my my popcorn can wait. I'm not going back down there. I really, I'm so curious if Crafty experienced anything because often there's only like one or two crew members on Crafty. Right. And they're down there alone when like scenes are actually shooting. There aren't people going down there. No. Just them, the ghosts, and the one light. And wherever they're going to like replenish the supply. That's, oh God, that took me way too long to get there. Like wherever their walk is to like go get extra of something. That would probably be so creepy, like down the dark hall all alone while no one's even at Crafty at the time. See, this is proof to me that so many more movie sets, TV sets are haunted because they set up and they're filming in haunted locations. And then you're bringing together so many people from all types of life, all walks of life, all over the world that might be spiritually inclined or who knows? Maybe they're practicing some rituals at night before they go to set. Who knows? Would what you let are a horror movie film in your home? Yeah, me too. Be- because it's well, one, it's cool, and two, the money. <laughs> I would ask. I think my one. I've so badly, Corinne. If we ever make a TV show together, or if I ever make I a want TV to. show of my own, I so badly. It's my one dream to play a dead body. It's like all I want. I'll will you out. I'll dra- I'll what do you want me to do? I'll be I'll be the dead body next to you. Great. We'll do it together. We have the Perfect. die holding hands. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> or should I play should I play the person who comes up and just like starts photographing the crime scene, you know, like I'm just chronicling it. I get like really close to CSI. Just, I'm just taking pictures of your feet. That's the only part of your dead body I'm taking pictures of. And then they learn that you're actually the killer because you love feet. <laughs> it's it's because of you and your only your only fan stream which will maybe one day happen <laughs> i have a lot of dreams i have been looking at this this entire time we've been recording but there's a little ca- like cat paw print that looks more leia size than kitten size but it's on the like wall at a high place parkour parkour and i'm like how and where and when Maybe you have like a giant slender man ghost who's just like, climb up the wall, kitty. Like, isn't this fun? <laughs> just lifting Leia but it's just all one. over the place. It's one singular. One. Which makes me think she it's leapt like, from go, a far it's distance. Pointing she downwards. Like ricocheted off of the wall. It's high up, though. Gosh, I don't know. You need to set up a camera, see if she makes that move again. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming and yeah, listening. Listening. <laughs> <laughs> have a great October. You're conversing with us. Hopefully we see you at one of our shows. We got a couple more weekends in the books. Hopefully this month of October doesn't make all of you severely haunted. If not, our live show certainly will. And if you are certainly haunted in any sort of way, please email us at twogirlsoneghostpodcast at gmail.com. You can also rate and review us on iTunes or really wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, wherever. Uh, and tell everybody about us. Let them get sipped pyramid into the triangle. Scheme. It's a pyramid scheme here, and we tell you all about yeah. it, and we're pretty open about it. And the we're scheme is that coming. you have to let two other people listen to our podcast. That's the scheme. All that will be left are the ghosts. All that will so be left are the ghosts. We must submit our souls to them. Mm-hmm. We love you all. Thank you to our team. Thank you to all of you. We love you. And we will see you on the other side.